can be the basis of recusal. I will now hand over before Madam Timekeeper asks me to to my learned friend, Mr. Boom. My lords and my ladies, uh, for completeness of our record, we have filed grounds of opposition. We also have filed a list and bundle of authorities, all dated the 22nd of October 2024. My lords and my lady, permit me to start by saying that judges just like any other judicial officer have a duty to sit they sit to determine disputes disputes between parties who come before them that is what makes us a country governed by the rule of law in that duty my lords and my lady it is important that we ensure there is efficiency in the conduct of that very important responsibility. That is on the one hand. On the other hand, it is important that judges then guard against manipulation of processes. In the context of what we have proceedings like we have today, the manipulation of process could manifest itself in the form of forum shopping where we say that I will file this matter before this court, before this court, and before this court. In my hope, one of them will give. And that if I run into headwinds in any particular direction, then I must, as of necessity, run away from that court. My lords and my lady, this is a position that has been adjudicated. The fact that the court has a duty to sit all the way to our Supreme Court. We have in our list and bundle of authorities provided, uh, cited one of the cases as by being a case of Gladys Beausoleil versus the Judicial Service Commission and a second party. At paragraph 5 of that decision, the court says that the doctrine of duty of a judge to see it, though not profound in Kenya's jurisdiction, then there's a thing, a spelling mistake, every judge has a duty to sit in a matter which they should duly sit in. Recusal should not be used to cripple a judge from sitting or to hear a matter. That duty to sit was buttressed by the fact that every judge took an oath of office to serve impartially and protect, administer, and defend the Constitution. In yet another decision, Peter Mwangi Gishuru versus the Attorney General and uh, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, at paragraph 61 of that decision, the court says, the court has a duty to sit on matters presented before it for resolution and should only recuse itself where circumstances permit, but not where it will create an unconstitutional moment by refusing to hear a litigant's case because the opposite party apprehends bias. In what context then should we understand that uh, jurisprudence. My lord, my lady, it must not be lost on us that when we are dealing with momentous topical issues of conversation in a country such as Kenya, like what we are dealing with, these matters evoke emotions. Just like in our election context, whenever a party loses, it is never so easy to accept the result of that loss. It is for that reason that sometimes people have all manner of 
uh, aspersions cast against the court, against the independent, uh, other, let's call it all other independent organs of the constitution because a decision has gone one way or the other in instances not favorable to one party and favorable to another. We must appreciate that we are in an adversarial system where, as of necessity, a decision will be determined or will be made in, one, in favor of one party as against the other. That said, my lord and my lady, Learned Senior Counsel Professor Gidu Mugai has made reference to the fact that the matter that is before you, though dubbed as recusal, is a matter whose subject matter has been completely determined. There is issue estoppel, and that everything that has been presented before you today are issues that were contained in the ruling that your lordships issued yesterday. As a starting point, I would make reference, my lords and my lady, to the application that was filed yesterday by our opponents. The application seeking to have this, the questioning the empanelment of this bench. If you look at paragraph Y of that application, on the, gray, uh, the, the, the grounds on the face of the application, my lords and my lady, the court was invited particularly to recuse itself. It then means that that motion for recusal was a motion that was live before this court. That motion was live between the same parties. It touched on the same issues that were presented before this court. The court pronounced itself on those on all those issues. What then is the business of bringing those issues through this second court application in the name of an application for recusal? My lords and my lady, if at all, as we now see, the applicants were not satisfied with that decision, the ruling of this court, the option that was available for them was to appeal that decision. Presenting this second uh, uh, application does not in any way open for them a door other than for purposes of delaying these proceedings. And I would say that with tremendous respect to my uh, learned friends from the other side, and so that I am able to demonstrate. Permit me to just look at the applications that have been filed and the issues that have been raised in those applications. I'll start with the application filed by my good friend, Dr. Evans Ogada. In his application dated the 21st of October, 2024, he raises as ground number one the issues of the certification of these matters on the 18th of October. That was an issue that was before you yesterday. At paragraph three, so that we understand context, he also says that on the next day, being Saturday 19th October 2024, the petitioners were surprised by the turn of events wherein they were served with an order of this honorable bench stating that the first and sixth respondents applications dated 18th October 2024 was coming up for interparties hearing. Again, that was an issue that was before you. At paragraph 4, it talks about the subsequent reference of the matter by the Chief Justice uh, on the 18, uh, to the Chief Justice on the 18th of October. That was an issue that was before you. Finally, he questions the unclear circumstances that led to the placement of the file of this bench on a Saturday uh, before you without the express directions of the Chief Justice. Again, my lords and my ladies, that was a matter that was before you. In the application by uh, Mr. Njiru uh, Ndegwa, again, the same thing. First ground, that the petitioners have learned that this bench sat on a Saturday, the 19th of October 2024. That was an issue that was before you. Paragraph 2 says that the petitioners were surprised by the sudden turn of events, again the same language used by the other application, in the other application, a matter that was before you. Paragraph 6 says that the petitioners are apprehensive that this honorable court 
has clearly demonstrated that the case for the Attorney General is more important than our, uh, than our petition, yet they are raising similar issues. Again, that issue was before you, and it was determined. Paragraph 8. Let me stop first there. How then do we treat all those issues that were before you? And if we are, just so that then we understand that these matters were before you, when you delivered your ruling, which was shared with us this afternoon, from paragraph 70, 73 all the way to paragraph 96, each and every of these issues were uh, responded to. I mean, determinations were made. At paragraph 79, for instance, the court says, but backed by this sequence of events, we take great ex exception to the petitioner's conduct that when favorable to the petitioners, orders issued outside the normal working hours of a court raise no concern. However, when the same court acts in an instance where it has been properly moved by the other parties and likewise proceeds to deal with an application at hand in the same vein, the petitioners show their indignation. That was a finding that was made. At paragraph 96, you even go further to say that one of the senior counsels went further by intimating that an exercise akin to the radical surgery may be forthcoming, a statement which we perceive as a veiled attempt at intimidating, uh, uh, at, at intimidation coming from senior counsel. My lords and my ladies, what is left that you're supposed to determine again? It is an attempt to have a second bite at that which has already sailed. If for one moment we were to look at uh, this application by Mr. Ndegwanziru, he then introduces very strange allegations, allegations which he has had to withdraw. Everybody saw his discomfort at making reference to those issues. But as you, 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 we all observed, these issues around making allegations and running away from them are meant to cast as passions and indirectly intimidate the court. Permit me to say, or to make reference to paragraph 8, where they say, for instance, that... Uh, the petitioners have credible information that Honorable Justice Mrima is a close associate to the proposed deputy president, uh, uh, one Mr. Kidure Kindiki, and that the said judge failed, refused, and or neglected to disclose that fact. Really, is that an issue that a party seeking the resolution of a matter that they brought under a certificate of urgency would want to raise to be a reason for a judge to disqualify himself? What is this association that we are talking about? What evidence have we tendered that there is anything that will be considered to be either untoward or that will make it inappropriate for uh, the judge to sit in these uh, proceedings? In fact, they go on to add in a paragraph that they sought to, uh, uh, one of the paragraphs, uh, paragraph 10, they say that this close association between Honorable Justice Mrima and the proposed nominee for the position of uh, Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya might have caused this court to convene and sit on a Saturday with a view of assisting one party in these proceedings. Is that not outrageous to say the least? We go on to say, at paragraph 11, that the petitioners are in possession of credible information that Mr. Jassi Sogola, who is the presiding judge in these proceedings, is conflicted as his spouse is a member of the Kenya Water Board, having been appointed by the President of the Republic of Kenya, who has in haste nominated Mr. Kidure Kindiki as his principal assistant. Allow me to pause on that allegation for one moment. What evidence do they present? Absolutely none. Today, let me take one step back. Yesterday, when the court was rising, we did put them on notice that we would seek to cross-examine the deponents of the affidavits that contained this uh, very uh, uh, unfortunate affirmant. To try and cure that, they then introduced a gazette notice 
in that gazette notice, my lords and my lady, they then seek to say, gazette notices speak for themselves. The gazette notice says, that is gazette notice number 7515, in the exercise of powers conferred by those provisions of the law, I appoint Rose Ombaki and Florence Auma Oloch to be members of the Kenya Water Towers Agency Board for a period of three years with effect from 9th of June 2023. The appointments by uh, Gazette Notice number this and this are thereby revoked. That Gazette Notice is signed by the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, uh, Climate Change and Forestry, Soipan Tuya. At what point, my lords and my lady, does then, at what point does it become that it is His Excellency the President who appointed uh, and to use the words His spouse is a member of the Kenya Water Towers Board having been appointed by the President of the Republic of Kenya. When we come with such outright lies, what are we trying to do to the court, to the individual members of the court, to the parties before these proceedings? Is it a case of saying that we will get out of that court by all means necessary, including by peddling lies? My lords and my lady, these are the grounds upon which you're being asked to recuse yourselves. I've also seen there was um, just give me one second there was a very an equally strange averment about Lady Justice uh, Freda Mugambi paragraph 16 okay let me just get that get that get That Lady Justice Mugambi is conflicted as such as, as she could. Wait a minute. No, it's not this one. But there is an averment to the effect that Lady Justice Frida Fred, uh, Mugambi was a student. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. That Lady Justice. Mugambi is conflicted as such she could recuse herself as she was Mr. Kiduri Kendiki's LLM student at Mo University, a crucial issue that she failed, refused, and or failed to disclose to the parties at the inception of the trail of the trial. My lords and my lady, the qualifications of our judges are no secret because they're state officers. You only need to go to the website of the Judicial Service Commission and you find the truth. My lord, my lady, when we saw this very strange averment, we took the trouble to go to the website of the Judicial Service Commission and we established that her ladyship, Justice Wilfrida Mugambi, got her LLM from Birmingham University in the UK. How then do we want to bring these lies and feed them to the people of Kenya, feed them to the court and expect that on account of such flimsy, concocted material, then the court should, uh, should, should uh, uh, recuse itself. Again, is it a case of us saying, by all means necessary, we shall not appear before that court? My lords, my ladies, there are clear standards and thresholds that have been established both by the regulations governing the conduct of the courts and even case law. That, my lords and my lady, first you exercise your conscience as to what should make you recuse yourself. Number two, in the event that a party is raising a concern as to your recusal, then it must be a substantial issue. 
it must be a substantial question that has been brought before you. It cannot be that every frivolous allegation that is meant, that is brought before the court, should make the court down its tools. That, my lords and my lady, will amount or will create or facilitate an environment where foreign, foreign shopping will be rife. We'll just need to mention anything that I went to school with so-and-so, that I go to church with so-and-so, that I travel with so-and-so, and that should be a reason for them to recuse themselves. That certainly cannot be the standard. My last and my lady, I would refer you to one of the decisions in our bundle and list of authorities. That's uh, re, uh, UNAD, Expert CJL 1986, uh, 60 AL JR 528, where the court had this to say, that although it is important that justice must be seen to be done, it is equally important that judicial officers discharge their duty and do not, by acceding too readily to suggestions and appearances of bias, encourage parties to believe that by seeking the disqualification of a judge, they will have their case tried by someone thought to be more likely to, to decide the case in their favor. My lords, my lady, the question that we'll be asking ourselves is what is that fundamental question that has been presented? And why this is an important concern is because sometimes such frivolous grounds are raised purely to embarrass the court. On this occasion, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that the net effect of what these allegations have done is an attempt at embarrassing the court. My lords and my lady, we urge that you resist that invite. You resist that temptation to ask the court to recuse itself on the basis of such flimsy, baseless allegations. Um, just to further speak to the fact that this is an attempt at embarrassing, if not intimidating the court. Our friends for the applicant have also indicated that they have simultaneously sent or lodged a complaint with the Judicial Service Commission. Following from the submissions that I made reference to in the ruling about intimidating the court with the radical surgery, again, going to the question of presenting this application for recusal after the one yesterday, and now going to lodge a complaint to the Judicial Service Commission, is that not an attempt at intimidating the court? My lords and my lady, I would not ask for an answer. That is an issue that anybody, any reasonable person out there would be able to make an indication or a determination about in their own uh, uh, space. My lords and my lady, is it also possible that this could be one of those issues that the, the, the applicants, or rather the respondents, have complained of as being a delaying tactic. Because we raised concerns yesterday. We are raising them again today. We have spent a whole afternoon arguing about issues that on the one hand had, had been completely determined by this court. The second part of those issues are issues that did not have any grounding, any material or in support whatsoever. <laughs> are those not meant to delay these proceedings by any, uh, by, any, uh, by any means necessary. Having taken cognizance of the fact that we came to you, both parties, under certificate of urgency, these matters must be treated with the urgency with which we came. And so we ask, my lords and my lady, that you dismiss that application with the contempt it deserves. May I now invite uh, my learned friend, Mr. Yamodi, to speak to a few of the uh, remaining issues. My Lord. My Lord, my lady, I wish to commence my submissions in opposition to the application for recusal before you this evening by tendering an unreserved apology on behalf of the members of the bar who have been urging and opposing the application before you today. Despite my relatively few years at the bar, 
I appreciate that prosecuting an application for recusal, and I have some experience in prosecuting applications for recusal, and it will become apparent in a moment, are not easy applications to prosecute. But the reason that I offer the unreserved apology is that it is my humble and respectful position that however difficult they are, there is no need for them to be prosecuted in as bad-natured a manner as these applications have been prosecuted before you. And for that, I 